and it's lights out on the pit wall. Welcome to our Fantasy Formula One podcast. I'm your host, Jean-Marc, and joining me this evening is my bro, Dominic, my father, Dr. David Kessler, and new to the podcast is Paola. Welcome. Uh, friends from college, the beauties of social media. We reconnected a few weeks ago when I saw her posting Fantasy Formula One content right there on her Instagram. And I was like, you're amazing. Let's get on on the podcast. So thank you for joining us. Let's begin with our reactions to the Monaco Grand Prix. Max Verstappen, first time he was able to get 60 points. That is our highest score for the whole season of a driver. Taking home a power streak, five points for finishing the top 10 for qualifying, finishing the top 10 for the race, getting another 10 points. And then crazy enough, as Verstappen would get 60 points, Hamilton, starting in seventh position, finishing in seventh place, would get the third highest score of 37 points. That just boggles my mind, but that's where consistency over the course of the season is key, because he also was able to get his power streak. But then the sad story of the pole sitter, Leclerc. I was following the story because he crashed at the end of qualifying and everyone on Ferrari was like, yeah, he's going to be able to race. I turn on the TV and I don't see his car. Where's this guy at? Paolo, how did you feel about the Monaco curse for Leclerc? I'm a huge Leclerc fan. I was rooting for him all weekend. I was excited. I was thrilled when he got provisional pole. At that point, I think everyone around the world was like, all right, buddy, just take it home. You have 30 seconds left on the clock for him to crash. I was so, so upset. The whole storyline was enraging because you have the team saying, I'm going to prioritize reliability over pole. And after that initial check, they say there's no serious damage. The message I was getting was everything's going to be okay. And even on Sunday morning, he was good to go. The anthem was playing. He was cleared. He thought he was going to be able to race. Now that we know that drive shaft issue and the gearbox issue were both a result of the crash. I blame the team for not doing their due diligence. Going forward, I think that they have to adjust their process in terms of checking for damage after a crash like that. And rip to the 42% of all fantasy teams that had him. I was turboing him on both my teams. Usually I go one Leclerc and one Norris. If I had done Norris, I would have got 98 points. That would have been insane. This was going to be probably our best chance at seeing somebody that was not a Red Bull or a Mercedes start a race and pull for the entire season, possibly. This is Ferrari's time to shine. This is their best chance of winning a race. And I'm not saying what they did was correct, but I'm saying I understand. This was a big gamble and it just didn't pay off this time. The FIA makes it very clear that you cannot change or fix any parts that are not clearly damaged or compromised. So to see the impact energy create a shockwave and then exit through the back left of the car where it put stress on that drive shaft, could they have done anything? How do you prove that your drive shaft is compromised unless there was like a fracture or something on there? If it was a hairline fracture, they probably would have been doomed anyways. I would have felt bad if he had taken the new gearbox and still DNF'd. And even though I am happy for Verstappen. First time since 2018 Germany in which Hamilton has not been leading the world championship. This is the first time Verstappen is leading his championship in his whole career. I got to be happy for one, but very sad for the other. I was all excited. I had Verstappen as my mega driver and Leclerc as my turbo. I would have been excited to see whether or not Verstappen could have passed Leclerc if he was on pole. And I could have had the best of both worlds if he had. Mm. Shout out to Driver61. He was doing a post-race analysis. The reason why he believes Leclerc actually clipped that corner is because the Ferrari is much better on these slow corners because the front turns in and it gets extra grip. And as the qualifying continued on, the car was able to get better grip with its tires. And so he thinks he probably did not anticipate how much grip he was going to get into that corner. Another major news point, props to Aston Martin. They had eight overtakes between their two drivers. Droll would get you the max bonus points because if you get five overtakes, then you get the max bonus points that you can get in a race. And Vettel, his three overtakes, he had a really good pitch strategy where he was able to leapfrog both Hamilton and Gasly because Hamilton failed to undercut Gasly. And I was actually watching the onboards for Hamilton. And here's my reasoning as to why Vettel was able to get a successful overcut. They were on softs 
And then they all switched to hards. And because the hards took a little bit longer to warm up, that's why their outlaps were so bad compared to everyone on worn soft. But bro, what did you think about the Aston Martin and their successful all points this race? There was a lot of pressure on Vettel. The experience showed and he was able to keep his head cool to get the job done. That's a good point because he had to do it for two laps to overtake both Hamilton and Gasly. I think even more impressive though was Perez pitted after Vettel, after Gasly, and after Hamilton, and rode that overcut wave all the way up to P4. I honestly forget Perez exists sometimes, <laughs> so <laughs> that True. whole race for me really put him back on my radar. In the end, was really what helped Red Bull get massive points to start leading the Constructors games. Since you're bringing that up, let's kick it over to Instagram where Formula One posted the driver standings. So Verstappen is now in the lead, 105 championship points. These aren't fantasy points. And then Norris was able to get to third place again, and Perez also was able to shift up. We also see now for the constructors, Red Bull by one point is now in the front. Aston Martin also was able to get enough points so that they could leapfrog AlphaTauri. Props to Giovinazzi getting the first points for Alfa Romeo. It'll be really exciting to see how it all plays out at the Baku circuit, since it should potentially favor Mercedes with that really long straight. I have confidence that they'll come back. So the crazy thing is that Red Bull, after this race, has just squeaked into the top constructor standing. But you need to understand, we had to have a win by Verstappen. Perez had to literally come from almost the middle of the grid to get into the top four. We had to have the most egregious pit stop I've seen in a while. And and Hamilton had to get stuck behind people he never dreamed he would ever be behind. That's what it took for Red Bull to be one point ahead of Mercedes at the end of this race. And Hamilton did say that this race does usually favor the Red Bulls. Maybe we will get to see Red Bull get a little bit of a pull away. True. Speaking of Hamilton, there's this hilarious clip of him after the race where he was asked, so uh, was there anything to learn from this race? Nah. <laughs> he was just like, nah, nothing I need to learn. The team, though, they've got plenty of stuff to learn. I was like, let's get on to how this race impacted the value of these drivers and constructors. What mystified me is that Ferrari went up nearly a million dollars in value over the course of three days. If you had Ferrari, your team value is shooting through the roof. So I want you to take a look at signs there. Went up by 0.3 since last week. And honestly, I feel like it was well-deserved. He didn't exactly qualify as good as he would have liked, but his race was solid. We are seeing a lot of hype for Ferrari. I guess what surprised me was Norris not increasing in value. Like, what else does he have to do? Yeah, that's probably because Norris was already owned by so many, and you get value when people bring you in. He's already on 63% of the team, so it's going to be hard for him to gain value. So you bring up a good point. Ferrari is only owned by roughly 10% of the teams going into last week. Now, 15% of the teams picked up Ferrari. So that's why they race so much. If you've got a 5% increase over the course of a week, that's why suddenly their value went up. Norris, since the beginning of the season, he's raised by 0.8 million. And I think, even though this is not confirmed, it's also by the rate in which people are picking them up. If suddenly everyone picks up that driver in like a 24 hour period, they're probably gonna shoot up in sentiment. It's like stocks. If you have a rush, it'll shoot up. So because so many people already have Norris, in essence, a, a little bit stuck in terms of cost. Mm. Right. There are some people who like the day trade. Well, Norris may not be a day trading option anymore. Of course, you're going to keep him on your team because he's getting consistent points. I wonder if Ricardo going to go down in price unless he pulls out a couple of good races. You bring up a good point. And to help visualize this, let's kick it over to the Google sheet so that we can all see what's been going on. Ricardo has gone down by negative 1.1 million since the beginning of the season. Finally, in the lead up to last race, he finally went positive for the very first time, which is why I made a video about why I wanted to pick him up, because I thought if, if he could go down in value by a million, then that means he's cheaper, which means that if he starts performing, maybe he will gain that million back and then it raises my value. Because of how he was doing leading up in free practice one and two, he only got around to like 63% sentiment. Not enough people were picking him up before the race, and then as soon as the race was over, <laughs> he's back down to the negatives. It's very sad. The sentiment around him is negative because he's not putting in the performances that his teammate is. And because of his cost, is it worth having him on your team in the long term? 
Well, speaking of putting a smile on my face, those golf liveries on the McLaren, it's one off. But I was like, why is oh. that there? Like, make a deal with golf and make that the rest of the season, please. Those liveries were amazing. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. The fact that I'm not going to be seeing that livery again, probably for the rest of the year, kind of bums me out, man. It's classic. It looked so good. Otas. Here he is. He goes into the pits, and as Legend now says, that they're going for the longest pit stop record. It'll probably be a week and two days or something like that. You have Botas. He's trying to do a good race. He pulls into the pits, and honestly, it's a coin flip what's to expect from his pit stop. Will it be good? Will it be long? Will he have his tire not come off? He doesn't know. <laughs> Imagine so. if he made a deal with Williams. Hey, you need some extra quid? Okay. Like, you'll do my pit stops this season because I cannot trust Mercedes. Now, Dad, you're more familiar with the machinery. From your perspective, what went wrong and what could be improved? How that works is when you put the gun on, if you don't push it all the way with pressure and you just catch the top of it, you can shear it off. Mm. So sometimes if they get excited and they don't push it hard enough, they'll have a problem. It's like a screw gun. If I'm putting a screw into wood, if I don't have enough downforce, I'll strip that screw and then I have to take it out. So I think that that's probably what happened. They initially didn't get it in well enough because they were were trying to do it too quickly and then it is stripped and they tried to use a different one and it was already gone by that time here's a counter conspiracy what if what's actually going on is because they keep messing up botas so much the mechanics are actually like overthinking it you, you know like when you've done something so much and then somebody's like yeah but how did you do that and all of a sudden bam you can't do it anymore there are 19 other pits every race and they're all fine it's time for heroes and zeros bro who is your hero Giovinazzi did a great race. We all know that in Monaco, where you qualify is very likely where you're going to finish the race. Giovinazzi was able to get into Q3. Alfa Romeo had had zero points going into this race, mm. and he was able to get them one point. So I give a hat off to him. That was excellent driving. Dad, who's your hero? It's gotta be Verstappen because he stayed concentrated when even he had the lead, decided to pick up the speed and really go fast. And to get the track record at 98 miles an hour, I was proud of him. Paola, who's your hero? I was originally going to go for Norris, but I think Perez deserves a huge shout out going up five places. He showed a lot of grit, especially towards the end, just giving Norris a really hard time mm. those last 15 laps. Even Norris said Perez was making him really nervous towards the end there. To do that overcut effectively, to go up that many places, I think he's finally getting a handle on the car. He's showing he's going to carry his own weight and he's going to be right up there with Verstappen pretty soon, I think. That's a good point because there was a big enough gap between Perez and Vettel that he could have pit to try to steal the fastest lap away from Hamilton. But because he was putting so much pressure on Norris, I bet you the team felt that the potential of getting third place compared to an extra point with fastest lap was worth keeping him in the race mentally. But imagine if he got Norris a lockup just once, he would have probably been able to get him to ruin his tires and he would have been able to try to pass him. For me, Gasly was another guy that the only person that ever paid attention to Gasly the whole race was Hamilton. That's because he was staring at his rear the whole race. Yes, Hamilton said he was as slow as all get out, but Hamilton wasn't passing him, so he was fast enough. I think that it's great that Gasly is finally able to reap the benefit of qualifying high, and hopefully moving forward, he gets the confidence now. On to our zeros. Bro, you put Leclerc. Seems like it's the obvious, but what's your takeaway? Why is he the zero? Honestly, I feel like we've talked about this to death already. So I'm just going to close with saying he made an error. It not only cost Ferrari the first place, but also his own points as well. And at the end of the day, we can talk about Gearbox. We can talk about the bad decisions on the team, but none of that would have mattered if he hadn't crashed in the first place. Good point. Good point indeed. Dad, you're zero? That has to be the pick crew. It'd be hard for me to pick up Botas, even though he's an excellent driver, because I don't know what's going to happen in the pits. Now, another person that we haven't talked about at all this whole podcast, Paula, who's your zero? For me, it is definitely Tsunoda. I think we were all impressed with him in Bahrain, uh, but since then, he's really struggled. And now in this race, he's ending up a lap down behind not one, but two Williams. Meanwhile, Gasly is scoring a fourth consecutive points finish. He really needs that reset button that everyone's talking about. The only time I think about him is when I see that 
track limit thing. So he's not staying within track limits. Yep. Yikes. Three weeks ago, negative 0.5 million drop. Two weeks ago, negative 0.4 million drop. This last week, 0.3 million drop. But like you guys said, we do want to see him do well. He's a likable guy. He only has had one Formula 2 season. And only one F3. Exactly. So one Formula 3, one Formula 2, immediately in the Formula 1. So he's been fast-tracked. I mean, when the news around you revolve around track limits, how many cuss words you use on the team radio, and your lack of experience instead of how much you're improving, I think that that says something. That's true. On to my zero, we've kind of mentioned already, Ricardo. Like with so many other drivers, if you're changing teams and you don't feel trust in that car, you cannot perform at Monaco. I think the reason why Vettel did so good is because, yes, he may not have a really good car this season, but he trusts that car. And that showed on this track. Ricardo was from very first practice. He says, I can't figure this out. He had a lot of negative things and he just never got his footing for him. I'm hoping that on other tracks, you'll get up to speed. But it's really hard because Ricardo is the weak link at McLaren right now. And Ferrari is so close to them in the constructors battle that if it wasn't for the DNF that Leclerc had, Ferrari would be running away from it. And so Norris is really keeping McLaren in that fight. It's now time to go over to our one race challenge. Thank you to everyone who's joining. 22 of you entered. Now, there was a question in one of the comments from a previous video. Maybe we should just have a season long and then we just update the standings. We talked about it internally and there's a couple reasons we want to explain to you why we're going to stick with what we currently have. We don't want someone to just join a league and then check out. If you make it on the podium, it's because you chose to enter your team this last week or two weeks and then me means you're excited to see that you got on the podium. And so we want people who are actively involved. And so that's why resetting it each week. Now we do understand that there is a 250 league limit. I don't expect you or me to join 250 leagues. Granted, if you're joining our one race challenges, there's a good chance you're gonna have 20 plus leagues. So you can unjoin. As a creator, I cannot delete the league unless everybody unjoins. And so it's up to you. If you would like to have it as historical sake, you can keep it. If you want to unjoin, that'll make it nice. You're going to see that our top six finishes use the Mega Driver or have already used their Mega Driver this season. So hats off to you guys. Verstappen did a really good job. Number one, the highest scoring team by using a Mega Driver this race, MD Racing. Hats off to you, 350 points. Now, for our podium places, the rules dictate that we will not calculate the multiplier for Mega Driver. Great news for you, MD. You get third place. Actually, technically, he was tied, but because, as you can see here, it's 101 value, he had the lesser value. So we do want to give a shout out to Schumacher Me Baby, because, yes, your value was 103, but you would have tied getting that amount of points at third place. So you are so close to being on the podium, but we want to give you that shout out. The other two that would take the first and second step on the podium Podium at the end of this video are both Canadians, the Stig and Patrick Team One. So you're going to be hearing the Canadian national anthem. So shout out to you guys. Now, Dad, you decided to do a Mega Driver this race. Walk us through your strategy or why you decided to not hold off till Silverstone. Verstappen gave me 60 times three is 180, which is great. I knew that if I waited, I might get more points with the sprint qualifier, but I know they all have the streak now. Will they all have the streak then? I don't know. True. Verstappen could DNF between here and Silverstone, and then that gamble wouldn't pay off. Did either Donick or Paolo, did either you do a Mega Driver this race? did not. I took mine out last minute. I had no confidence going into Bali in any one particular driver. Um, that's a good point. When I put the polls out on Twitter, that's some of the things people were saying is with the threat Ferrari was showing, was it wisest to put Verstappen or even Hamilton? I feel sorry for anyone who would have mega drivered Hamilton this race. He still got 37 points, but he was not up there where you would want him if you were going to mega driver him. I actually had Hamilton as my mega driver after the Spanish Grand Prix, given his track record. Once I saw how they were doing during practice, it was a pretty obvious choice to take him <laughs> off. So. You're like, cut your losses like... Yoink, take that off. <laughs> well, that was a good, that was a wise choice. That was a wise choice. Let me give a quick promo to the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. The league code will be in the description below. 
And once we get 10 entrants, I'll be able to put our custom cover and avatar on there. And so thank you again for everyone who's joining. If you are the top three, and this is how we do our criteria, no mega driver calculations and tie breaks are by lowest valued team because you were able to afford greater drivers with less. Now that we have our one race reaction, it's time to present our orc elite. This is a calculation, a crunching of the numbers in my Google spreadsheet that meets two criteria, a team that costs 100 or less than 100 million and the team does not have a mega driver because you can only pick one per half season. That's um, crazy that this race would allow the Orc Elite to have 305 points. Shout out to anybody who would have had signs instead of Leclerc. If you stuck to your guns and turboed Norris and got 98 points, that's where you would have got the huge haul. And Mazepin getting his Orc Elite for the very first time. So much for Mazda spin, and we can't even say that now. He's now making progress. Whoa, let's not be too hasty. <laughs> He's still got a little bit to prove, I think. But we should make a little Orc Elite medal. Go find him and be like, hey, buddy, you earned this. And there we have it. Thank you so much for joining us this week. It has been an amazing time seeing your comments. Many people have been trying Fantasy Formula 1 for the very first time. And if we're able to be a part of your journey, experiencing this season in real time, it's been a pleasure. We have been your Knights in Racing Armor. Thank you, bro, for joining us. Thank you, Paola. And thank you, Dad. Father. <laughs> and until next time, we'll see you on the pit wall. <laughs>